Hi, Critical Analysis. This video is for Thursday, April 2nd. So I hope you all enjoyed your April Fool's Day. And uh, we are nearing the end of our week 11 here. So just as a reminder, do this coming Friday, April 3rd, are some assignments in Chapter 7. So I'm just going to real quick show you there. Inside Chapter 7 by tomorrow, Friday, April 3rd, is your Chapter 7 text sheet, which you have the sheet there and where you're going to drop it right there, and then your Chapter 7 vocabulary quiz. So both of those things are due on Friday, April 3rd, so that um, we can kind of wrap up the chapter and, and move on because we are going to start chapter eight today. So those two things will wrap up chapter seven. Most of you have already submitted those and I've been trying to touch base with people who have not been submitting things. Uh, but regardless, if you have any questions, always feel free to reach out to me. I know some of you have been taking advantage of, you know, calling and texting and that is perfectly fine with me. I'm just happy to, to make sure that everyone feels comfortable and is touching base with me. Okay, so Today's video is going to start chapter eight and chapter eight by the time this video is uploaded will be available for you to view. So you're going to click into chapter eight. Now you'll notice when you get in there, we have uh, two PowerPoints. So the reason that is, is because there's like the typical text PowerPoint and then there's a PowerPoint that I like to use. <laughs> so uh, the regular PowerPoint is there and it's going to look like kind of the other chapter PowerPoints. The focus of this chapter is on psychology, and I know, I think at least one of you is a psychology major. And then everyone else, they, you might kind of still find these readings interesting. I know I do. It talks about like why we lie, um, why people behave the way they do, kind of issues in the mental health world, uh, violence in TV. So I think there's a lot of neat discussions in this chapter. Uh, the concept that this chapter focuses on is author's argument. Now, the reason I don't use this particular PowerPoint as heavily is because to me, the, publisher, the publishers of this book took two chapters, chapter eight and chapter nine, and split them when I think they kind of could have been one chapter. So you're going to see in chapter eight, and I'm going to refer to things that you're also going to see in chapter nine because they have very similar uh, concepts and discussions. So that's the reason I'm just going to go ahead and use the PowerPoint that's on your screen right now. And if you want to look at it, you know, it is the one that just says critical thinking PowerPoint. So that's what I'm going to start off with. So we've already been introduced to this concept back in a previous chapter because we talked about one of the most basic things critical thinkers need to be able to do is determine the difference between facts and opinions, which we spent uh, chapter six on talking about facts and opinions. So being a critical reader, it means you go beyond the surface that you're not just going to kind of accept what is written because someone wrote it. You're going to question. You're going to look at details. You're going to look at facts and apply what you've learned. You're going to know what the, the thesis and the author's point and the purpose and all of that is. So we're going to talk about some of those kinds concepts here and then in a video next week we'll practice a few of those concepts as well. So just as a re reminder, refresher I guess because we've already talked about fact and opinion, a fact is something that can be proven. So something, remember we said we can prove a fact false. So the hallmark of a fact is that it's a it's provable through some sort of measurement, some sort of observation, you know, and opinions are not. So examples of facts, you know, we saw this again um, with the fact and opinion chapter, you know, things that you can verify and look up so they can be proven either true or false. And then opinions are those things that they're debatable, they are someone's personal belief, they are something that someone feels strongly about, uh, but you could go and kind of look and debate, you can't prove it. So you look for judgment words, you look for words that are gonna show attitudes or beliefs or guesses or something along those lines. So those are also some additional opinion words and phrases that you could just be familiar with when it comes to picking out your particular like fact versus opinion. And then using context, because as we saw in chapter six and some of our practices, uh, that it is common for authors to try to 
you know, use opinions and try to pass them off as facts or use different kinds of words that can seem like it's their fact when it's actually their opinion. So just knowing kind of the context, how things are using in that particular case. So that's important as well. Okay. Then moving on, this is something we have not talked about yet, but this is one of your mastery skills that we are actually going to um, see very soon here. I already did the video for this one, so this will be open soon. Author's purpose. So when you have a purpose, it's basically, why did the author write this? That's the question that's being posed. To find the purpose, you read, you have to know the main idea, and then ask yourself, why did the author write this? And there are generally five purposes. To inform means just what it sounds like. The author is going to give you information. So here's a textbook, here's a newspaper, here's some kind of you know encyclopedia. The main purpose is to give you information. So there's no opinions, there's no attitudes. It's just facts, just presentation of information. Another purpose might be to persuade. Perfect timing, you know, the elections, I know they were postponed, but we had elections recently. And, um, you know, around election time, people are trying to persuade or convince you to believe that their candidate is the one to choose. So persuade is when someone's trying to convince you or make you feel a certain way using emotions. Sometimes they'll put in facts. Sometimes they'll kind of anger you, excite you, whatever it takes to make you convinced to feel the same way. Entertain is just what it sounds like. They want to try to make you laugh, make you kind of forget about your troubles, sometimes like evoke different kind of maybe sad emotions, but the whole purpose is to entertain. To narrate means to tell a story. I always think of like Morgan Freeman, <laughs> like a narrator. So it's telling a story in the way that it occurred. So just kind of like if you were to go home after work one day and someone would say, how was your day? And you told them about your day, you are narrating. You are going through a story of events. And then describe. A lot of us do visualize what we read when we read. However, that's not quite enough because it's pretty natural. Describe or descriptive writing means the author really is trying to make you see, smell, taste, feel, hear. All of those senses are really in there for the, and the author is really trying to make you in that place. So when you're trying to find the purpose, you ask again, why did the author write this? So for instance, if I had the sentence, the ocean tides are a result of the gravitational pull of the sun and the moon. Well, if I look at my purposes, that seems like it's pretty informative. It's trying to tell me something. It's trying to give me facts. If I were to look at this, you should not swim in areas inhabited by sea lions and seals. Often if someone's saying what you should or should not do or should or can't or won't, they're trying to persuade you. They're trying to give you reasons to do or not do something. I'm on a seafood diet. I see food and I eat it. That's supposed to entertain you. It's supposed to make you laugh a little bit. So again, when you read these things, you're supposed to be asking yourself, okay, why did the author write this? You know, what was their purpose behind this? And if you're taking college comp, academic writing, uh, effective speaking, all those kinds of classes, odds are you're going to have to do one of these kinds of writing or speeches. So you're going to see some crossover there. All right, also connected with this topic of purpose, we're also going to talk about audience. So audience can also, these all these things are going to tie together. Audience can help you determine the, the purpose and tone. So basically when you're writing something or when you're reading something, you want to have your audience in mind as a writer. And then as a reader, you should be asking, you know, for whom was this written? Was this written for a group of experts? Was this written for people who are just casually interested in this topic? Was this written for beginners? Because that can really help you figure out what the purpose is as well. Tone, I don't know if you were ever told, or maybe now as a parent, some of you are finding yourself you saying it, like, watch your tone with me. We can communicate tone through our words, just like an author can communicate tone through their choice of words in text. So a tone is when an author's attitudes or feelings are evident. So you can pick up on their tone, meaning, oh, they really don't like this topic, or they really like this topic, or, you know, there's some negative, there's some positive. So tone is how an author feels about a particular topic. And it's important to not let your own attitude influence as you read. You know, 
as, as humans, it's pretty natural for us to have opinions. And so when we're reading something that doesn't necessarily align with our views, it's easy for us to like dismiss it. Be like, eh, that doesn't, I don't think, I don't agree, so I'm not going to read it. So when we're reading, especially for academic purposes, it's really important to kind of set our personal opinions and attitudes aside so that we can evaluate something without bias. We can look at it and see. So attitude is when an author, um, you know, they, they make their feelings evident. It, and that's what they're doing with tone. So tone, you kind of look to see the main idea and then generally look to see if there's positive or negative words or phrases. Um, if, if they are, then you can kind of see what their attitude is. So that's, we'll kind of quickly pause there just as a reminder. Um, purpose is why an author wrote a particular piece of writing. Audience is for who it was written. And tone is the attitude or feeling that you get from an author. Now, in class, I would typically do lots of papers and lots of practice with these concepts, which obviously we're not going to be able to do. So in one of the videos next week, I'll pull up some, some websites and I'll pull up some other examples that I may potentially use to kind of just illustrate some of these topics we're talking about here. Also, in this concept, remember I said chapter 8 and chapter 9 are very similar with a lot of the things they talk about. So in chapter 8 and 9, they talk about bias and point of view. So bias is really connected to tone, honestly. It's when you know how an author feels about a topic. So if they are showing their bias, that means that you can tell that they are either for or against something. If they are unbiased, that means they're not showing any preference. And a lot of textbook writing, newspaper writing, that's supposed to be unbiased. That is supposed to be giving you just the facts, not a personal opinion. Uh, and the reason this is important, because if you know when someone's biased, it, you know that they might be trying to influence your thinking. And therefore, you can look to see at the opposite point of view so that you can kind of understand, okay, well, this is how this author feels about it. Let's get the other side of the story. You don't want to miss the full story because you're tricked into reading something that is biased. Um, another way someone can be unbiased is if they give you both the good and the bad. If they're giving you both the good and the bad, that's another example of unbiased because they're trying to present to you the whole story. Uh, point of view is, again, very connected. A lot of these concepts are very closely related. Point of view is, their, is someone's attitude or perspective, you know, where they're coming from on a particular topic. All right. So here's an example. This country depends too much on foreign oil resources instead of meeting its own energy needs with domestic resources. This person has bias against using foreign oil. They say we depend too much on foreign oil. So just kind of looking to see how people feel about particular topics. So those are the concepts from this chapter. Uh, chapter 8 specifically goes into more depth about auth author's argument. So knowing, and this kind of goes into like that point of view, knowing an author's position or bias on an issue. You know, are they presenting facts or opinions? Are they giving both sides of an argument? Uh, is there like attitude? What, what is their purpose for writing? So just knowing authors' um, arguments, knowing if they're trying to present a particular point of view. And sometimes they'll do that by giving facts, examples, statistics. So all of these things kind of come together when you're writing, reading a piece of text to kind of help you understand more fully the, the main idea and how it all works together. So if you want to look more about like author's argument, there the slide that covers specifically chapter eight is in here and it talks about like all these different ways authors can provide support for arguments whenever they want to present their their purpose for a particular topic. So that is some information, as I said, on chapter eight and nine. So chapter nine, you'll see some similarities in some of these concepts. So those two PowerPoints are right there in your chapter eight. And I also just want to show you real quickly that in the mastery skills, I believe this was just earlier today. Is anyone else's days running together? My days are definitely running together. Uh, I believe it was just this morning. Yep, here we go. 
purpose and tone. I created the video for purpose and tone. I've not opened the test yet as of right now. I will after um, we talk more about chapter eight, but that test is in there since chapter eight talks about purpose and tone. Okay, so let's go ahead and get back into chapter eight because we are going to work on our text sheet and grab some vocabulary. So here's my chapter eight completed study guide. I don't know why I cut off there, but I'm gonna pull up my study guide and then here is my chapter eight text sheet. So I'm gonna have both of those things up and running. And then I'm also going to get into my textbook. So I have these things going for me here. All right, so chapter eight, getting all of my paper copies settled around here. Chapter eight, as I mentioned before, is on psychology, and it's going to talk a lot about that debate, nature versus nurture. And that's a big topic in the psychology field. So if you are interested in that, there's the little introduction, the introduction to the field of psychology is there. And I always think that it's a really interesting field. And a lot of you are going to have to end up taking psychology as a course in your program plan, psychology or sociology, or possibly both. So you'll get to, to read a little bit more about that regardless. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to take a look at our text sheet. So I'm going to pull that up. And the first thing we're going to do is part 1b. So we're going to skip to this part right here. And we're going to do a couple passages. I'm going to do two with you and then you're going to do two or one on your own. And this is going to practice that concept of like author's argument. So to get there, if you're typing in page numbers, we're going to be around page 447. If you're just using your table of contents, I'm going to click on my skill focus. And then I'm going to go on practicing the skill. And my first one I'm going to be looking at is passage three. And according to my text sheet, I'm just going to be answering question one. So I'm not even getting to argument yet. I'm going to question one. So the passage says, why are some people happier than others? You might think this question has an easy answer. Aren't some people happier than others because better things happen to them? That's true in part, but you might be surprised to learn that genetics has a large impact on how happy people are as they make their way through life. So as I read that, hopefully you were able to tell that they used the word happy, happy, happier, happy over and over. So basically what they were talking about here, the topic was levels of happiness. So our topic here, I'm on part 1B, what is the topic is levels of happiness. Let's space that out a little bit. That's our topic. That's the who or what. So it's kind of taking us through a little bit of mini practices here. Now it wants us to read passage four right underneath it. And this time we're answering what is the argument? Like, what, what's the point the author's trying to make? So as I read this, try to come up with you with, you know, what is he trying to prove? I'm not surprised that adults find children today to be spoiled, but I don't think this is a new phenomenon either. I think it's unfair to fault one single generation of such an old, historically common parent-child dynamic. The way I see it, one fashion or another, we are all spoiled, but in different ways. Our society is such that everyone feels entitled, even parents. So even though you're not writing this on the line, the topic to me seems to be like this idea of being spoiled. And they're saying like, this isn't new. Um, why are people calling kids today spoiled? This has always been going on. So that's kind of what the author's argument is, is that it's not just kids that are spoiled. Basically, everyone is spoiled. You know, parents, grandparents, society in general, everyone is spoiled. That's their argument. Everyone is spoiled. And they support that by just giving examples, kind of saying, you know, this has been going on for a long time. And so they're just kind of using examples and logic to back that up. All right. And then scrolling down a little bit more, you are going to read passage five. And I'll actually read this to you and then you're going to, um, I'll tell you what you're going to read here. It says all bullies should be given meds for hyperactive behavior. One study reported that 80% of those identified as neighborhood bullies suffer from ADD or attention deficit disorder. If we recognize these kids not as simply evil and aggressive, but as children who need medical attention, we can better solve the problem and keep our own children safe. Okay. So we are looking, if you look at passage five, your argument, and that's not what it's asking for in your text sheet yet. 
But your argument is essentially saying that um, a lot of bullies aren't just being bullies to be jerks. They might need medical help. So, because they mentioned like ADD. So it's kind of the argument is that bullies are not mean. Rather, look at this, 80% have ADD. So it's kind of their argument. So what you are going to do on your tax sheet, it wants to know the support type. How are they supporting that? So look back at the article little passage here and their argument is that bullies often suffer from ADD like bullies often have medical issues that's why they're bullies how do they support that what do they give what do they state as their support or their evidence for that claim that most bullies have ADD so think about that reread it um, again, when they're asking, when, when they mean like what kind of support, do they give an example? Did they give a statistic? Did they mention a report? Um, did they give an opinion? So what kind of support is there? And it might even be like a combination of a couple of things, potentially, depending on how you're reading it and what you're picking up. So that's what you're going to fill out there for passage five support type. Is it examples, statistics? Is there like a cause effect relationship? Is there like a data source? Is it opinion? So that's what you're putting there. Okay, so now we're going to look at up here, part 1A, and we're going to look at the selection called Why and How Do People Lie? So I'm going to go back and scroll up a little bit because it's my reading number one. Reading number one, why and how do people lie? If you're searching for it there, it's on page 438 if you're using page numbers. So I want you to just kind of think if you know anyone. I'm sorry, this, the story itself starts on 436. Um, if you think you know of anyone who does a lot of lying, maybe it's yourself. I don't know. <laughs> so, uh, you know, when is it okay to lie? When does it become a problem for pe when people lie? So I'm going to encourage you to go ahead and pause the uh, video and read the selection, Why and How Do People Lie? And it's pretty, pretty interesting uh, selection. So I'll have you pause it and then we'll come back together and talk about the vocabulary and the questions you're going to answer. Okay, I'm going to hopefully assume that you have paused and have read that article, Why and How Do People Lie? And first, we're going to go over the vocabulary terms that you would have found in this particular selection as you read. So they are going to be on my Chapter 8 study guide here, the first couple here. So in this collection, you would have seen on page 437 the word hypothesis. So hopefully, you're already familiar with this word, the word hypothesis, meaning like an educated guess. This is not just a shot in the dark. This is something that, you know, especially in science class, you make an educated guess and then you would test that. But hypothesis is an educated guess. On page 436, we see the word aspire. So right now, all of you are aspiring, hopefully, to just stay healthy and get through this. Right? You hope to do this. So aspire means to hope or hope to become something. Page 437, we see the word conceal. Uh, they're concealing things. They're lying. They're hiding. Conceal means to hide, to try to cover up. Also in 437, we see the word or the phrase pathological liar. So this is someone who has kind of gone beyond just telling those little white lies. They have a constant pattern of lying. So it's almost like, a, like an issue. They just lie all the time. And then finally, on 437, we see the word plausible. It means believable or credible. If something is plausible, you can believe it. Makes sense. There's some credibility to that. All right. Then, part of this are this set of questions right up here, 2, 7, 9, and 10, which I will take a look at with you. So we'll go down here. 2, 7, 9, and 10, I'll answer these with you now. So question number two says, what is the topic of this reading passage? So it's not just lying, but it's 
C, factors related to the act of lying. So it goes into, you know, some detail about how and why we lie. So the factors relating to the act of lying is uh, question two. So we are looking at C for question two. Okay, and then we're going to take a look at, sorry, I've got way too many papers on my desk here. Uh, question I think I skipped number one. Nope, two, seven, nine, ten. All right, sorry about that. Two and then seven. So scroll down to number seven. What is the main idea of the final paragraph? So I'm going to go ahead and just kind of reread that final paragraph for you. It says, another study looked into the brains of people who qualify as pathological liars. These are individuals who lie with sufficient regularity that the behavior is considered abnormal. The overall structure of brains of the pathological liars were compared using MRI to the brains of matched controls. Those brain comparisons revealed consistent differences in the prefrontal cortex. The pathological liars, for example, had more of the type of brain tissue that allows neurons to communicate with each other. Prefrontal cortex is a region of the brain that plays an important role in planning, suggesting that the pathological liars are particularly well equipped to plan their lies. These results, however, leave open the question of cause and effect. Did pathological liars start life with brains of this type, or did frequent lying change their brains? So the main idea of that particular paragraph is, hopefully, they're talking about pathological liars. These aren't even main ideas. You could throw C and D out. But pathological liars' brain structures differ from the norm. So number seven is B. Okay, then we're looking at number nine and 10. So nine, what is the author's tone in this passage? So basically kind of how are they approaching this? Hopefully you didn't get very many emotional vibes or angry. It was pretty objective, meaning there's really not an opinion. This is just information trying to tell you about the act of lying. And so what do you think the purpose of this article is then? I kind of gave it away if it's objective, they are informing D. All right, so on our tech sheet, for part A at the top there, we said two was C, seven was B as in boy, nine was B as in boy, and 10 was D as in dog. So that is our tech sheet, and one and A and B up there are completely done now. All right, from there, we are going to go scroll down and we're gonna look at this article right here. No debate, TV violence harms kids, pages 452 to 453. So I'm gonna go back here and it is going to be right here, reading 3A. <clears throat> and this one's really interesting. So I, again, I'm gonna have you know, encourage you to pause and think about this. You know, do you think that watching too much TV causes violence? Do you think that you know, that has an impact on us? Because this is something, again, that's really debated quite frequently. Um, if, if watching too much violence on TV can cause kids to be violent themselves. And then it's not part of this, but there's a follow up that's after this particular article that talks about kind of the opposite. You, I guess that says TV violence doesn't lead to kids so like they talk a lot about uh, the different side of that as well so again I'm gonna have you go ahead and pause the video and read no debate TV violence harms kids and then we'll come back together and talk about the vocabulary words and the questions that you'll answer Okay, again, hopefully you have paused, you've read the article, and now we're gonna go ahead and take a look at the vocabulary words that have to do with this particular reading. So we are looking at, again, I'm constantly flipping back and forth here, pages 452 to 453. Let me scroll down here. And we have just a little subset here. On page 453, we have the word monitor, which just means to check. So it's talking about monitoring your, your kids' viewing habits, checking. Page 453 also has the word impulsivity. I'm sure we've all done something impulsive, right? We act without thinking. You know, we just do something. It's very impulsive. We don't plan it. 
And then on page 453, we also have the word aggressive, meaning kind of like a little bit of anger. Um, we had in a previous chapter the word like accosted. So it's like that angry outlash, so to speak. So that's aggressive. So those are the three that we see in that reading. All right. As we are looking at the questions, we are looking at questions three, five, and six. So if we scroll down here, three, five, and six. So we just talked about this word right here. Make every effort to monitor your child's viewing habits. Well, that happens to be one of our vocabulary terms. It means to check, or in this case, keep track of. See, keep track of. Okay. Also, we're answering question number five. What's the main idea of the reading? So what they're essentially asking is, what is the thesis? Uh, if you had to summarize all of those paragraphs together and to come to one sentence that would let the reader know what the entire article is about, how would you summarize that? So if you look at your options, hopefully you can kind of narrow it down by looking at the ones that have too many details in it, and B is our main idea of this particular article, that close monitoring and helpful strategies can protect children from the harmful effects of TV violence. They're saying, you know, basically just pay attention to what your kids are doing, and that can help make sure that TV violence doesn't lead to real life violence. All right, and then question number six. What are a few arguments Dr. Mintel makes about TV and violence? So this I want you to, to kind of answer on your own. So go back into the story and find out where Dr. Mintel talks about kind of some of the arguments being made uh, as it relates to TV and violence. And you are going to come up with, um, I said three arguments. So three arguments that Dr. Mintel makes as it relates to TV and violence in this particular reading. So that's what you're going to fill in right here. So we answered three and five together. You are going to come up with three. I mean, there are several more, but, and Dr. Mental is the author. So if you're looking for like a quote, you're not gonna see a quote by that person. Dr. Mental wrote the entire article. So three arguments that Dr. Mental made about TV and uh, violence. So what are the three things? And by that, I don't mean like little whole sentences. She says that TV violence is, so you're basically Three things, three arguments, three points she's trying to make about TV violence as it relates to kids. That's what you're doing on your own. We did three and five. We said three was C and five was B. So pause the video if you need to and fill the rest of that out. And then we're going to go ahead and take a look at part two down here at the bottom, page 460 to 465. get into it here. This is our textbook application. All right. So for textbook application, this is an excerpt from an actual textbook, uh, What Makes Psychology Unique, and it's going to read just like a textbook. And it's got pictures, and it's got different concepts in there. So I'm going to have you read that. Um, and we're going to talk about the vocabulary. You only will get two vocabulary terms from this reading, even though it's a little bit longer of a reading. We're only going to get two vocabulary terms. I'm going to go over those ones now. So in this particular section, you're going to see the word phenomena on page 464, which just means something that's extraordinary. It's not an everyday occurrence. It's extraordinary, extraordinary. It doesn't happen very often. Um, like the solar eclipse. That's pretty extraordinary. It's a phenomenon. It doesn't happen all the time. And then you're also going to see the word data on page 462. And that's like research that's collected, whether it's, you know, like statistics, interviews, test scores, whatever it might be. In this case, they're talking about, you know, different concepts of psychology. When you are done reading that selection, I'm not going to go over any of these with you. Isn't that fun when I let you on your own? You're going to read the comprehension check questions. So you're answering one, three, six, seven, eight, nine. So you're going to look 
again, scrolling down here. Here we go. Reading comprehension check. So you have some questions, and I'm having you do this on your own because it, a lot of them will have you practicing, you know, what supports the author's argument, what, what is the pattern of organization here, what's the tone, so it's practicing some of these concepts. So I'll have you read that and fill out part 2A. And then if you need to pause and come back to me, that's fine. We're going to talk about part B now at the bottom. So part B is your TED Talk. Your TED Talk is called What's So Funny About Mental Illness? Now, I will say, like, I pulled it up. It is a rather short video. Uh, it's one of our shorter TED Talks. It's only about eight and a half minutes long. It is very... It's interesting because uh, the speaker suffers from a lot of mental issues. She's very upfront about it. She talks about how our brain is really not cut out for today's age. And I think we're seeing that kind of now during this time where a lot of us are feeling isolated and anxious about what's happening. And so this is kind of timely in that way, even though this was back in 2012 when she presented this. So there's the actual TED Talk if you want to Google it, what's so funny about mental illness, you can certainly listen to it. If you prefer to read or you want to read along while listening, it's the TED Talk right there. So I'm going to go over the vocabulary that you're going to see and talk to you about the questions you're going to answer. The vocabulary you're going to see from this particular article is down here, absorbent down. Uh, page 467, we see the word absorbent, and that doesn't help that I just wrote it twice. <laughs> Um, absorbent means to soak in. I kind of think of like a sponge. To soak in. So absorbent to soak something in. Like they say like bra babies' brains are absorbent. They soak everything in. Page 467. Inundated means you're overwhelmed with. Right now you might be inundated with work or news or whatever. You're kind of overwhelmed with it. 468, we have the word neurons, which means to transmit impulses. Those things in our brains that transmit our impulses, which leads to transmitting on page 469, which is just another way of saying sending. Also on 469 is the word glitch, which means an error. Um, my four-year-old is really into this word glitch all of a sudden. It, like if something doesn't go right on a, a video we're watching, or, oh, it's glitching, it's glitching. <laughs> so like an error or something that stops the progress. And then on page 470, we have the word stigma, which means a negative association. So those are the vocabulary terms you'll hear or see in the article as you read or listen to it. And then after you read or listen to the TED Talk, you'll answer questions one and four. So after that, questions one and four. Question one says, what do we learn about Ruby Wax's mother? How do you think this affected her career choice? So it's a two-parter. What did you learn about her mom and how did that affect her career? And then question four wants to know what good news and bad news does the speaker offer in paragraphs six and seven? So it does help you address your question, like where to look more particularly. So those are the two questions that you'll be answering in regard to your TED Talk. So that finishes your tech sheet. This is kind of a combination. I did several with you, and I have you, had you do several on your own. So your Chapter 8 tech sheet is going to be due Tuesday, April 7th. So you have time to kind of finish this up on your own. Um, like I said, I did some of it with you and some of it you're doing on your own. So down here, Chapter 8 tech sheet, drop it right in there by Tuesday, April 7th. Your vocabulary, we did not finish the vocabulary because there is a biography uh, where the rest of the words come from. So we did not talk about that yet. Uh, page 444, this is a psychology chapter. So I'm going to go back up here. Oh my goodness. I'm going to scroll down and we're going to see good old Sigmund Freud, father of psychology, as most people kind of think about him, especially as it regards to psychoanalysis. So we're going to see just a couple vocabulary terms in his bio there. And I encourage you to read it anyway because he was an interesting dude. 
so it's always interesting to read a little bit more about him. So we do see in his little bio here, right here, we see the word traumatic. So something's traumatic, it means it's really upsetting. Um, again, for instance, everything that we're going through right now, for some people, this is really traumatic. People are getting sick, no people who are getting sick, our lives are being turned upside down. This is disturbing for us. Now on the opposite end of that, page 445, we have the word therapeutic, which means we're easing or something that's healing. For some people, that literally is like therapy sessions. For some people, it's music. For some people, it's animals. Something that kind of eases. Page 445 also talks about self-analysis to kind of think about yourself, to analyze yourself, reflect on your actions or your thoughts. And then page 445, we also see the word colleagues, people that you work with. You know, right now, for some of you, it might be the people you live with because you are working from home. So that finishes the study guide. I'm not going to upload the quiz in there quite yet. The quiz will come next week. So for now, once again, you are just completing the chapter eight text sheet right there. You're dropping that by Tuesday, April 7th. Um, the study guide is right here. The empty one's up there. My completed one is right here. Uh, and then I'll have the quiz in there next week. Also in next week's videos, I will be pulling up some practices that'll go along with the concepts from chapters eight and nine. The author's bias, tone, purpose, um, audience, argument. So we'll look at some examples as it relates to different you know, paragraphs in, in different contexts. So we will see that. Uh, and I think that about covers it. All right, talk to you next time.